A few years ago, I predicted that the next major RTS to release would fail. I didn't want it to be true, of course, but I felt like modern strategy games were just out of touch with what people actually want, and unless something changed, these games were going to continue to crash and burn. So when Company of Heroes 3 released, like many people, I was incredibly disappointed. The game was half finished. But I seriously wanted to be wrong, so instead of jumping on and making a video saying, ha ha, I told you so, I decided to give them an entire year to patch things up. So let's take a look at Company of Heroes 3, talk about what Relic has fixed in the last year, what they've ignored, and what unfortunately they've made worse. The first thing to look at is the hook that draws players in, the campaign. Relic decided to be bold with this release. Instead of a traditional RTS consisting of handcrafted missions stitched together with story elements, they created what they marketed as an innovative, dynamic campaign. So let's see what they came up with. The campaign starts off with a short cutscene setting the stage. The 1943 Allied invasion of Italy is beginning, and ooh, this plane crash does not look good. The first tutorial mission starts off making landfall on the Sicilian coast. We control a single squad while learning the basics of unit movement, using cover, and how to throw the world's most destructive grenade. The mission then opens up, giving us more squads as we advance through Axis forces, learning to capture territory, and eventually driving a tank around and blowing everything up. All in all, it's a bit chaotic, but solid for a tutorial. It teaches the basics and suggests things like taking optimal cover positions. It isn't railroaded and lets you play around with your tools. It strikes a good balance of teaching and doing. This is a good start. We then begin the second half of the tutorial. We zoom out into a 4X style strategic map. Instead of jumping from mission to mission with hubs and briefings, we're instead building and managing our forces in this secondary gameplay mode. You know what? I'm down. I love Battle for Middle Earth 2 and Empire at War, so this could be amazing. We're given our first company, the Indian Artillery, and we use it to hunt down, oh, we don't actually do anything skillful to attack these enemy companies, and instead we get something that looks like it came out of Civilization V. That is... a choice. During this segment, we're also introduced to the two generals we'll be working with. The brash, aggressive General Buckram and the logistics-focused, level-headed General Norton. They often have conflicting views on how the war should be approached and were very quickly given a choice. Do we follow Norton's advice and secure the port of Tropia, or do we go straight for the Germans in Chittanova? Once again, I like this. Well, I would if these choices mattered. Very quickly, we're going to have multiple companies running around, meaning that they can't do any sort of trolley problems with the choices. Because we can be in multiple places at once, we never have to pick the lesser of two evils. What presents itself as a series of choices is going to quickly devolve into, hey, go over here before four turns are over, and if you do, I get really happy. That was General Buckram, by the way, that's what he sounds like, I promise. After conquering both towns and the Order obviously having no consequence, we train a second company, the US Airborne. And as we continue the Forex tutorial, it honestly is just not that interesting. We roll over a few towns, auto battle another company, and finally capture Catanzaro, finishing off the teaching session and heading into the main campaign. And the first thing that happens is that we're asked what sort of company of heroes we want to start with. We can pick from the US Special Forces, US Airborne Division, UK Indian Artillery, or, hear me out, or, for the low, low price of $16.99, you can buy the Hammer and Shield Expansion Pack to play as the UK Air and Sea Company. Keep in mind that this game already released at $59.99 and has not once gone below $40 meaning that we're prompted to spend 77 total dollars after having only completed a tutorial. And this expansion is abysmally rated on Steam, absolutely dumpster tier. But hey, the expansion model is still far better than those mobile game shops that have multiple different currencies that exist only to obfuscate how much you're actually being price gouged. At least Relic isn't going to stoop that low, right? As we begin the main campaign, we pan down the sizable map of Italy that we have to drive the Axis forces out of. This is a lot of area to cover, so we begin with the invasion of Salerno. This mission... wait, why are they teaching me how to play again? The Salerno invasion acts as a second tutorial, though to be fair it does escalate significantly faster and teaches more advanced things such as the game's very light construction element with the... Uh, whoa, what a great animation. I feel like I'm back in 2006 with this one. Look at how everything pops in and then jiggles around as six guys shovel in one place. Amazing. But I'm sure for another $16.99 I can buy a better animation. All in all, Salerno is a solid first mission. 
There's a lot going on with capturing many points, side objectives, and a charge up to the hospital which can be pretty deadly. But until the end, there's no pressure of you losing, and the game makes sure to explain things as you go. Once we secure the hospital, we have to destroy the two bridges leading into town as enemy tanks roll in. Thankfully, training hint string 11225805 wasn't found, otherwise I would have been in some trouble here. After using our battleship barrage power to destroy the bridges, we emerge victorious and return to the strategic view, where we get to select the first of our skills. Company skills was a fantastic idea. Each company has a different selection of available units and abilities, as well as a skill tree to supplement. Beating enemies and completing objectives provide skill points, which can be used to get exclusive upgrades, unit unlocks, and passive abilities. It gives a nice degree of player freedom to build which companies you want and then upgrade them in your own unique way. I'm upgrading my Gurkha infantry because I really like them, but I could just as easily be upgrading the field artillery instead. Now that I have my upgrades, it's time for the enemy to strike back. The Germans send a tank company to Salerno to reclaim the city. This defense mission is where some of the core flaws in Company of Heroes starts to appear. Namely, the AI. I'm playing on expert difficulty, which means that in this defense section, the enemy sends an overwhelming number of units. I get a single tank and some infantry squads to hold off a good 30 enemy infantry as well as 10 tanks. Numerically, this should be straight up impossible, even with a defender's advantage. The only reason we can win is because the opponent is dumb as bricks. Watch this fight, I match off against an enemy Stuka anti-tank assault gun and he catches my Sherman out of position. Having me pinned, he instead speeds off heading towards the south and finds a parking space I guess and then dies. Then an enemy panther appears, one of the strongest German tanks, who proceeds to charge me, clip into me, and then also explode. Company of Heroes is fundamentally about controlling low numbers of units, a handful of squad, and a few vehicles at most. So when the AI is consistently, on the hardest difficulty, refusing to fight, it gets old quick. And that's a shame. This mission is actually pretty cool. The atmosphere of the enemy artillery flattening the area before wave after wave of forces crush into my defenses is neat. I just wish it wasn't so dampened by the elites showing up and looking like they're texting while driving. After Salerno is saved, the game opens up a bit. There are now a variety of towns to seize as well as the freedom to decide where to go. And so begins the mid game, also known as mostly skirmish battles. This threw me for a bit of a loop when I returned to the game. When Company of Heroes originally released, this stage of the campaign was an absolute train wreck. But things have changed, and now it's a slightly different train wreck. Skirmish battles are, in effect, one versus ones against the AI. When one of these towns is attacked, a skirmish is triggered. It loads the match and we play it out, generally with a couple of twists. The game cycles between objectives. Sometimes you need to beat enough opponents to run them out of points, other times hold territory, or occasionally a no-build mission where you get a squad and have to hunt down some objectives. But the novelty wears off fast, it just isn't a very interesting game mode. But it used to be awful. If you recall back to the tutorial when we did the civilization style fighting, when the game released every single time that two companies attacked each other in open ground, there would be a full skirmish battle. At some point, it was patched, and now open field encounters are auto-resolves. The campaign is split between missions that are scripted and purpose-built, and these skirmishes. It used to be that you'd play about 10 or so skirmishes per mission, but now we only fight at towns, so we're doing about 3 or 4 skirmishes per mission. Which means that the campaign is now only about half half as long as it used to be. And I can't complain about this. I would obviously much rather be given a brief campaign with substance over repetitive excess. But the game's price sure didn't drop to accompany the playtime loss. This change also completely screws up the balancing. It used to be that your companies leveled up slowly and gained skill points over time. Now when they mash into each other for 3 seconds, it's the same as winning a 15 minute skirmish battle. You accumulate skill points at such a ridiculous rate, and there's no cap to a company's level. So the thing I said earlier about building your customized company for yourself, yeah, that was a lie. Everybody gets everything really quickly. And the rewards are absurd. At level 1, skirmishes are pretty tough. Your company is limited in the units it has available, often slowly moving through the map, vying for control with infantry, only later to bring in a few light vehicles and maybe a larger tank if you're lucky. But in the later stages, you have access to these powerful and fast call-ins, and when combined with the fact that the AI just doesn't know how to play the objectives, you get some awful results. Wait, I kind of feel like I need to emphasize that. The AI does not know how to play the objectives in this game. All it does is run around and capture points, and most of the time that happens to be the objective, but it doesn't know what to prioritize. 
Take for example, this skirmish that I played about one third of the way into the campaign. I spawn in, am given the objective that we have to control two points surrounding the enemy headquarters for one minute and 30 seconds. So I take my initial troopers and head across the map, drop paratroopers onto one of the points, paradrop machine gunners onto the other, and the enemy runs around like an idiot. A couple of their squads randomly run into my capture forces, but more run into the middle of the map and completely ignore the objective. I basically lose everything at top, but the AI is so brain dead it doesn't register that it's under pressure of losing to a timer, so it doesn't move anything to the point until it's far too late, ending the skirmish in about three minutes. These skirmishes also have dynamic bonus objectives to add some variety. Sometimes you'll have to capture an enemy anti-tank gun, or a convoy of damaged tanks will appear and you need to take them out. It sounds cool, and sometimes it really is, but once again, it often just doesn't work. For example, in this skirmish, I got a bonus to rescue an ally whose vehicle was disabled while scouting behind enemy lines. And I can only imagine what horrors awaited this poor soul the moment he spawned in, because between the pop-up of return the armored car to base and failing the objective, there was an entire six seconds. I failed a bonus objective in six seconds. And you can round it up to 10 if you start counting from when the pop-up appeared instead of disappeared. These things are constantly happening in skirmishes. Bad AI, broken bonuses, and absurd abilities breaking the missions before they even begin. This skirmish that I played is the perfect example of everything. I'm playing as the American Armor, who have a call-in that instantly summons an M3 Stuart light tank. The objective is to capture and hold three victory points in the middle of the map. So I load in, start my infantry going around and taking territory, and send in the first Stuart. The enemy makes a bit of infantry, we squabble for a bit, I take the victory points, and continue with the Stuart spam. They're not a broken unit, but they're good against early infantry, and I like them. And then I get a bonus objective to capture an enemy anti-tank gun, which sort of excites me. I'm going tank spam and the objective is going to send out anti-tank guns against me and I have to disable and capture them? That's pretty spicy. The AI also gets some really nice stuff out very quickly. A Panzer IV and a Stuck anti-tank assault gun. The expert AI cheats on resources, so it has these far earlier than they normally would. And they will absolutely annihilate my three stewards without taking more than a paint scratch. This is good gameplay. Give me a problem and now I have to scramble to solve it. Or not. The AI just can't figure out how to shoot me. They absolutely, positively refuse to take two seconds out of their anti-tank weapons days to turn my entire army into goo. They instead shoot this building for a bit and then fire a pair of formality shots as they turn around and leave. As they retreat and die, I think I spot an anti-tank gun for the bonus, but it's actually a flak gun for anti-infantry. The enemy, who spent all of their money on tanks and flak guns that they couldn't use, proceeds to just fall over and die, ending the mission in six minutes. And of course, this catastrophic collapse happened without ever spawning the anti-tank gun bonus in. Now that I think about that, it's actually pretty big brain on their part. Deny me the extra skill points by making it impossible to do the bonuses by not building the unit I'm supposed to capture. Awesome stuff. The skirmish battles are fluff and nothing more. A pile of inadequate AI and repetitive objectives on uninteresting maps where winning often comes from interactions that are more frustrating than fun. These skirmish battles are a pox on the campaign. A majority of the gameplay feels like the RTS equivalent of grinding, and it takes away from the real missions. Which is a shame. Some of the missions are truly spectacles. The close quarters urban combat of Potenza, fighting our way to the railway siege gun in Anzio. The incredible verticality of scaling Monte Cassino, and fighting through the fiery hellscape of Ortona. Each of these scripted missions I had a clear, positive memory of coming back to this review. When I revisited them, they were so far above the rest of the campaign. There were obviously people working on this project that both had the knowledge and vision to make some absolutely amazing campaign missions. And instead of investing in that passion and skill, resources were squandered on a half-baked game mode that tries to artificially inflate the number of encounters so it can justify trying to sell you the Hammer and Shield expansion pack for the low, low price of $16.99. So the campaign is rough. I think I've beaten that drum a bit too long at this point, so let's take a look at the next step for a user. The typical player will check out the campaign, and then if they're still craving more, the natural progression is to hop onto skirmish mode. Wait a minute, that's not good. 
Company of Heroes is not a game known for its one versus one skirmish, and that is completely fine. The game is all about team battles. The epic scale of three versus three and four versus four skirmishes is where the series shines. The focus on map control instead of rushing down enemy bases lends itself to these scales really well. So if everybody, including me, loves the team aspect, why does the campaign spend its entire time trying to convince you that the skirmish is one versus one? How is a new player supposed to know that team games are where to go to have fun? This feels like a huge oversight from Relic. It is very important to guide players towards goals that they might find fulfilling, and this game does the opposite. There's a well-established path that the majority of new players to an RTS will approach things. They start with the campaign, once done, they move on to co-op and AI skirmishes, and then they start playing those skirmishes with real players, and finally start focusing on more competitive modes. Obviously, everybody's experience is different, but if you want to maximize the number of people coming back and enjoying your game, making these steps easy and accessible is one of the most important things you can do as a developer. Company of Heroes makes this very first jump from one game mode to another both unappealing and confusing, and that is a shame. But despite being the most popular mode, team games are also not perfect. If you're playing either with or against the AI, the same problems as the campaign still apply, namely that the computer is dumb. But there is another, more fundamental problem that crops up quickly, one that doesn't matter if you're facing the AI or real people. Being set in the Second World War, we're obviously limited to semi-realistic infantry and vehicles, specifically stuff that would show up in the mid-war Italian setting. So, if you want to drive the epic King Tiger heavy tank, you gotta go to Company of Heroes 2 for that. The cataclysmic Sturmtiger? Company of Heroes 2. How about piloting the American answer to these threats, the Pershing? Or the hilarious looking KV-2? Or the iconic Soviet T-34? Or how about literally anything involving Soviets at all? Company of Heroes 2. Relic decided to make a game where they were competing directly against their previous product and gave less gameplay variety. What? There's no room for imagination or creativity with units. This is a historical game. They can't make up new stuff. But unit variety doesn't have to be everything. If the game plays well, the audio is great, and the vibes are there, you can be a successful game with a more limited roster. So let's explore some of the non-gameplay decisions. When the game was initially launched, it was pretty hotly criticized for having weak sound effects. I'm not 100% sure, but it does feel like they've put some effort into making it have a bit more oomph. The units sound more punchy, and the explosions in particular sound more… explosive. They seem to be trying for a more realistic vibe. And real war is chaotic, that's the feeling that they want to capture. Now, sound is a very subjective experience, but personally, this realistic chaos creates an experience that I find unappealing and confusing. And that's not even getting into the sounds that are outright unhearable. Sure hope that whatever he had to say wasn't important. In a strategy game, sound is just as important as visuals for conveying information, helping you utilize multiple senses to make correct decisions quickly and efficiently. Have a listen to this battle and see if you can tell me what audio was important and what was just fluff. I have about 80 hours in this game now, and I couldn't pick out a single individual piece of information from that pile of audio slop. There's a famous anecdote about the nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island. Leading up to what would eventually become a meltdown, the control room always had at least 52 alarms going off, and when the disaster started, there were over a hundred. The people in charge of the control room were so overwhelmed that they couldn't tell what was most important, making what should have been a minor inconvenience, an easily fixed error, into a partial core meltdown. That's what it feels like to play Company of Heroes 3, a cacophony of disparate sounds all aggressively vying for your attention, making it exceedingly difficult to know what you need to react to. 
If Relic were making a movie, this would be perfect. It's the exact vibe that the chaotic action sequence from a World War II film should have. But making a game is an entirely different beast. Real war may have involved people shouting things over each other, but I just want to know which one of my units is under attack. Contrast this to a game like Red Alert 2, which leans into the artifice of the medium and has distinct sounds for each weapon. Ready to roll. The voice lines are short, and each unit sounds drastically different from each other. I can go anywhere. I can see him. Pilot reporting. Changing vector. I've got the knowledge. Analyzing schematics. <laughs> this iconicity is totally missing from Company of Heroes 3, leading to a frustrating user experience. Fortunately, there is a neat little workaround if you want to slow things down a bit. The Nibelwerfe has an attack that's so loud that it currently crashes the game. So, I was gonna try to get a clip of this crash when I found an evil Vofo, so I made a save, and then the game crashed while I was saving in preparation for the game to crash. Which brings me to my next point. This game is not stable. It crashed on me four times through a 10-hour campaign playthrough, but the crashes are not the only inconvenience. I also got softlocked twice, where the game still runs and completely locks you out of playing. Once when this guy just decided to repeatedly run into Jerry forever, and once during the enemy turn where they just never passed the turn back to me for some reason. So I was stuck watching this plane orbit forever until I alt f 4 And saving and reloading could help here, but reloading isn't always the best idea. On the mission with the Nibelwerfe, I saved and reloaded later to see if it would crash again, and it reset my bonus objective project from 3 of 5 planes to 0, and only spawned 2 more planes, making the bonus impossible. With all these factors coming together, the public perception of the game at release was abysmal. The people were justifiably upset, retention was low, and Relic knew they had pushed an unfinished, buggy product. But behind the scenes, they were already working on their big patch to fix everything. They call it Operation Sapphire Jackal. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Though they'd already lost many players by this point, if they can drop a successful patch, Company of Heroes can be saved. So what are the main features of this patch? Sorry, this operation. Well, front and center, both in Relic's mind and in the patch notes, is the crown jewel that will restore this series to the throne. An in-game store for an already full-price game, complete with daily and weekly quests, mobile game-style currency obfuscation, and of course, lots and lots of microtransactions. Ugh... In its most charitable interpretation, this move was incredibly tone-deaf and out of touch, pushing the store out in the first patch, when everything is still broken to this day, sends a clear message to the players. And the players sent one back. The community was furious, the game review-bombed, and Relic's reputation thrashed. Three months after the game's initial release, Relic's parent company Sega would lay off 120 of Relic's employees. External factors were blamed, but looking objectively, we all know what happened. I don't know who made the decision to rush out an incomplete game and repurpose a respected franchise into a predatory money-making machine, but I'd be willing to bet my entire life savings that the people that made that decision were not the ones that ended up getting fired. Company of Heroes 3 didn't fail because of problematic systems, bad audio, or even soft locks and crashing. It failed because of inept executives who chose to spend development resources on looting the player base instead of building a product that was worth spending money on. We've seen Relic make functional, popular games as recently as Age of Empires 4. The developers, or former developers, are clearly skilled, but without time or money, even the best and brightest don't stand a chance. As we were putting the final touches on this video ready to ship it off, we got another development. Relic and Sega have formally split apart. This is either really good or really bad. Like many people, I really, really, really want to believe that the executives at Sega were behind this short-sighted greed that we've been seeing. And now Relic will have the creative freedom to go back to their roots and make awesome games once again. But one thing is for sure. If they want to leave this difficult era behind them and regain their reputation, Relic's next title is going to have to be a banger. So let's talk about the potential future for Relic Entertainment, my thoughts on what might work, and ignore how this section isn't going to flow very well into the next one because it was written so much later. 
But all that happened between nine months and a year ago, and now things are starting to look a little bit different. Maybe I'm coping, but it sort of looks like there's a glimmer of hope. A few days ago, Relic's community team made a post on the r slash Company of Heroes subreddit. In this post, they updated the community on an update to their update. In December 2023, they started taking player feedback, and crazily enough, it seems like they're actually listening to it. Operation Coral Viper, <laughs> I know. The 1.6 patch, which was once pretty stale, is now getting user-generated content in the form of maps, a host of quality of life options, and two new battle groups, one of which is free. And then once the departure from Sega was announced, they decided to make the patch come out earlier, and everybody seems to really like it. Relic and Sega are never going to admit they tried to loot the community for cash without providing almost anything in return, but at least this is progress in the right direction. Patches like these that provide real, tangible content and are not completely locked behind a paywall are a solid attempt at stopping the hemorrhaging and restoring the brand. But one fundamental issue is still going to remain. As long as Company of Heroes stays the same way that it currently is, they are punished. Every single time that they end up making a great World War II game, the next title has to compete against a great World War II game. It's a self-destructive cycle. So to close this out, I wanted to take a look at the future of the series, what strengths Company of Heroes has, and suggest a way that they might be able to make a comeback. The first advantage they have is territory. Relic RTSs have always adored the idea of taking territory and fighting opponents on the field instead of rushing enemy bases directly, and I think this is worth sticking to. While it isn't super inclusive to those of us who prefer base building elements, it is a successful formula that makes engaging games. Second is the basic game flow. The feeling of both sides starting off with a few infantry, then limiting each other's movement with barbed wire, machine guns, and flamethrowers, which then need to be dislodged via mortars or light vehicles, that then begins an arm race of defensive and offensive vehicles, increasingly powerful artillery, some plane usage, and finally capping out with the big old tanks that can finally break through the enemy lines. This is a good story arc that appears in every single skirmish. And Company of Heroes 3 has dramatically improved the urban combat aspect of it. Watching cities being leveled as you make your way through them is a powerful experience. It's done so well that the first time that I pushed through the urban environments of Potenza, it took me straight back to this Belgian town that I visited in 2015. It's a town named Ypres, and 100 years ago, it looked like this. Infantry into machine guns, mortars, light vehicles, and artillery, finally breaking through with tanks. I can't be the only one that thinks that this basic progression sounds very familiar. Relic, listen real close here, because I'm about to tell you a secret that basically every other game, TV, and film studio doesn't know. There were actually two world wars. You already have built the technology to make an absolutely banger World War I game. You don't need to rehash the same thing over and over. Your focus on small groups of stuff, maybe a few tanks at a time that are controlled meticulously, gels perfectly with the era. And people adore this era. One of the reasons that Battlefield 1 is so universally beloved is because the World War I vibe goes hard. Gas masks, flamethrowers, shotguns, zeppelins, also cavalry? biplanes, machine guns, and maybe coolest of all, land ships. The First World War is sorely underrepresented in modern media, doubly so in the real-time strategy scene. While Paradox may have recently released Great War Western Front, Relic RTSs are so different that it would be something completely unique. Stop remaking the same game over and over. Stop competing with yourself. Identify that you have some good ingredients here, and if you put them together in a different way, you can make something that people genuinely want. I don't think that Relic is doomed as a company. I've seen they've taken Age of Empires 4 and carved out a niche that its players are quite happy with. If they can take their time-tested mechanics, apply a fresh and exciting spin to them, let the campaign be constructed out of actual handcrafted missions, and put an actual effort into making a fun-to-fight AI, I see the potential for an absolute banger of a game. But most importantly, treat the players right. Strategy game players tend to skew older. They're not kids who are naive enough to be tricked by mobile game currency obfuscation and overpriced DLC. But by being older, they also have more money to spend. I've seen time and time again that they are willing to both commit and invest for the long term into a title that treats them with the respect that they deserve. 
Thanks for watching. I don't like making videos like this. I want to spend my time celebrating the incredible achievements of passionate developers and modders. So I've decided that I'm going to be cautiously optimistic about Relic's future. The separation from Sega is guaranteed to be rough, but I would love more than anything to see a return to form, and for this to only be a small road bump in the company's history. But that's all for now. Next time, we're going to talk about trains.